Right. And of course that's showing up in front of everything else. There we go. All right, so welcome to week one of CSD 8250, the muffled edition. Um, I'll do my best to project. I just can't project through cotton very well, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself in a moment. Um, so I'm gonna go through who I am first, and then I'll talk about what you guys are gonna be learning, how the evaluation is gonna go for this course. You're all level two, so you've already had a kick at the can already. Um, and I'll talk about the hours and I'll talk about my lab policies and stuff. And then I'll actually get into the first lecture. Um, so, look, hey, yeah, come in. So I graduated in 1996 from Canada College. I'm a college graduate. That means I don't have extra fancy letters after my name. Um, that doesn't mean I know less, it just means I've been working longer. Um, I, did, I graduated as a, as a um, computer programmer analyst, which, you know, doesn't mean much because it's all just different names for the same job. Uh, I've been working as a professional developer of some sort ever since. Um, minus, I think, two and a half weeks of unemployment in the last 20, uh, six years, apparently, if I do my math right. So it's a good industry to be in. Um, I work full time and I teach part time. Uh, I work for a company called Catlink Technology Corp. Nobody's ever heard of it, so I don't even feel offended that nobody's ever heard of them. Uh, we're really small. We've been around for almost 30 years, but we're really small. But we control uh, over 40% of whatever market we're in. So, you know, it's an interesting company. Uh, what do I do? Technically, I'm a full stack web developer. I also happen to be the uh, Amazon Web Services Administrator. And as of no longer today, I was also doing like desk side support at random when people forgot how to copy and paste. Uh, why? Because apparently I knew how to figure out the answers really fast. Um, but yes, so if you're talking about somebody who knows their way around database and web development, that's basically my, my resume. Uh, so what kind of person am I? As you may have already noticed by now, I tend to be a pretty easygoing, somewhat sarcastic person who's uh, got a fairly loose teaching style. I don't have notes. I just use the slide decks as a reminder of what I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, I've been teaching database in one shape, form or other for over 10 years, 12 years. It's not that different from one course to the other, so, you know. Uh, I'm also a prof that tends to understand life happens. In other words, you know, if shit happens, let me know and I'll, you know, take into account. I'm completely okay. I was like that pre, you know, pandemic. It's not like I'm going to change post pandemic. So if something happens, let me know ahead of time. You don't need to worry that I'm going to, you know, take it out on you because you're sitting in a hospital for insert reason here. Or, you know, your dog ate your laptop for the third time. That one gets a little hard to take. You know, the first time I can believe, the second time I could believe, the third time maybe you should just, you know, not leave your laptop where your dog can eat it. But there's, you know, within reason. Um, I've been told I tend to roast my students on a regular basis. Uh, I've kind of missed doing that while I was doing remote because I really had no visual feedback of what was happening in a room. It's just a bunch of black boxes. With, if I was really lucky, one or two people would turn on their cameras to keep me company. So, you know, it's been a little strange standing in front of a group of people actually looking at me and actually seeing faces. Only seeing this much, but you know, it's still better than nothing. Um, at least now I get some feedback of whether or not when I'm talking, people are actually grasping what I'm talking about. Okay, so these slides were, I inherited these slides and I swore to myself I would update this slide for this term if I taught this course again. And obviously I did not. But, okay, so attendance. And essentially, the way I'm gonna go about this is try to come to lecture. If you're sick, don't come to lecture. I don't care what you're sick with, I don't want it. The people sitting next to you don't want it. 
if it's hay fever and you're taking lots of good pills that make you drowsy, fantastic. Come, ahead, come to class, you know. I won't feel offended. Sit at the back so you don't snore and wake up, keep everybody distracted. But if you're snotting and coughing, I don't want you here. Some of the other profs might be a little more anal retentive about your attendance, but I don't want you here. Which leads me to some of, most of you have noticed I'm wearing a microphone and I've got a camera pointed at me. It's not my usual camera. This laptop really hates my, my good camera, so I apologize about the terrible depth of field and the fantastic angle it's gonna have. Um, what I do is I record my lectures and I'll post them on Brightspace so that if you're sick, you're not gonna lose out on anything, okay? The chair of my department has stated that we're not supposed to record our lectures, but I don't give a shit. Um, I've been doing it from before she became the chair of my department. I'm at the, no, I've been doing this pre-pandemic. I've been recording my lectures for 10 years. Uh, if you're really industrious, you can probably find my old lectures on YouTube. Just saying. Uh, I, when last time I taught this course and it was uploaded to YouTube, I didn't actually have a microphone. So the audio is total garbage. Just warning you now, it's by the webcam's microphone. You can imagine what that's like. Especially that one class where I had somebody sitting in the second row playing League of Legends. And all you could hear the whole entire video is Yeah. That's a big no-no. Um, as for the labs, I totally realize that my labs are probably your last labs of the day. Right? I think uh, 7.30 tonight is the first one, and I think it's at uh, 6 o'clock tomorrow. My lab policy is come if you need help. I don't take attendance in labs. If you can do the work and you're confident, go home and do it at home. I'm okay with that. I do not cover new material in labs. Okay? I'm there to help you get through the material. And there's only two lab sections. So, you know. Um, I will let you guys float between lab sections after the first week. Not this week. Please come to your properly scheduled lab section if you're having problems getting MySQL installed. After this week, once we start doing normal labs, you can float between the two lab times. It's posted on Brightspace. Where and when. Okay? Um, I'm not going to tell you guys down to a specific lab time, especially, you know, if you've got a part-time job on Thursdays and I'm your only class, why would I make you do it to you? You know, so feel free to float. I don't care. Um, again, this course has a lot of content. It's very front-loaded, actually. It's kind of weird. There's a lot of stuff in the first two or three weeks. Um, and then it slows down a bit, which is good. Compared to the other courses where, you know, just before the break, you're all crying because you're overwhelmed. I'm going to try to not overwhelm you. Um, if you get sick, exceptional circumstances, you decide to pass a kidney stone while having pancreatitis, hey, let me know. I've been there. Literally. Two years ago. So it's not a fun time. Take my word for it. When you got pain here and here at the same time, it's not good. So I'm okay with that. So. All the course materials on Brightspace. There are going to be links, extra things to read. Read them. <laughs> it will help round off what I talk about in class. Um, I'm not going to say I'm going to teach you every single word you need to know. But if it's in writing and it's attached to the course shell, you're probably expected to be aware of said content. Um, PDF of the textbook, I don't know where that's coming from um, because there is no PDF of a textbook. Not when it was given to me and it's not listed in the course outline. So I have no idea what they were talking about. But that's okay because I've got PDFs of documents that do the job. Um, all the slideshows are up. So that's there. And I will be posting announcements every week. The announcements will contain what should you be working on? Uh, links to the recording, asides and notes from the class in case I did something stupid in class and I said something stupid in class and I have to correct myself. I will correct myself in writing. I will admit I was stupid and said something dumb. Uh, that's never happened. The, so it'll, you'll see it's a pretty well organized thing. It literally tells this is what you're going to be working on. This is what's coming down the pipe. This is when your tests are going to be. It's all, oh, there's no mysteries at all. 
Okay, so you need to finish your labs, obviously. Half of your grade is your labs. Not doing three labs, or even, you know, there's 10 labs. So yeah, doing three, not doing three of your labs is like taking 10% off your grade. It's not a good thing to be doing. Do your labs. They are not insane. Um, I allow a late submission and sometimes I, I pretend to not notice the time. So yeah, if you're like six days late, you're gonna take the 20% penalty. If you're like a day late, I'm probably not gonna notice. Labs later than a week get an automatic goose egg. Unless, you know, you took the time to notify me that maybe you weren't having a good time. You know, problems with your computer, sick, you know, roommates kicked you out in your living and get no park. You know, insert reasons here. There's all kinds of reasons why you can't get the work done. I just want to know before it comes up and two weeks after it was due, they go, I didn't have a chance to do the lab. Can you forgive me? No. I got other stuff to do. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to hunt you down. I'm going to treat you guys like adults when it comes to your work. Do it. At a job, we tell you to do something. We expect you to do it by the deadline. If you don't do it by the deadline, anybody in here who has worked and did not do what they were supposed to do will probably know what I'm talking about when you, they're not happy with you. I'm, I don't care if you do your work or not. It's easy for me to grade and give zeros. I don't have to work at that. So just do the work and hand it in. You will be graded and you will receive points. So feel free to interrupt me if you have questions because you know that's how it goes. Um, feel free to work in groups. Yes, Discord's a fantastic thing. I know the sound of Discord very well. Over the years, I've run Discord channels for my students. I didn't bother this term yet because I don't know how it's gonna roll out, so we'll see. But uh, yeah. Okay, so what are you gonna be learning? Today, once I'm through my introduction, is an intro to data modeling and database design. So basically, it's gonna be an info dump. I guarantee by the end of this class, your brains are gonna be leaking out of your ears because it's just a sheer info dump. But the info dump has to happen at some point, so might as well do it on the first day while you know, you're not feeling overwhelmed. Then you're gonna learn about ERDs. You're gonna learn about normalization, which that word will mean nothing to you until I teach, teach you what it is. But if anybody's ever worked in database, you've probably heard the phrase normalization, and uh, it's just a tool or a process. Um, Week four, I'm gonna go through, through the whole design, database design process from start to end. Uh, week five, I'll be talking about indexes and views. So now we're gonna start talking about the mechanical sides of things. Uh, week six will be a midterm review and or anything I missed. So this is the plan. If things go sideways, I have basically week six as a buffer of open time and space to cover material I may have missed or whatever and get you guys ready for your midterm. Week seven, we're all gonna sit here and do our tests on our laptops. Fantastic. Um, week eight, we get to take a week off. I'm gonna go sit at a lake and fish for a week. Week nine, we're gonna learn about backup and restore followed by security. Basically, database admin work. Um, week 11, we're gonna talk about triggers. Week 12 is stored procedures, so basically, you are gonna learn how to program a database. Whenever somebody tells you that you're using SQL and you're running queries and you're programming a database, no, you're not. That's not what that is. Think of it as someone who does this for a living. That's not programming a database. All you're doing is asking the database questions. It's just as good as saying, hey, Google, what's the weather outside? Except you're using formalized syntax. This is actually writing code with if statements and loops and variables and conditionals and you know cursors and crap. It's actually a topic I enjoy teaching because people get shocked just how much you can make a database do. And as a guy who does both the database development and design and the programming, I never trust the programmer because programmers suck. We take shortcuts because we're tired. We're working on too many things at the same time. The database guy never makes mistakes, right? Coming from the guy who does both jobs. Um, week 13 is transactions. 
the basically I'm going to it's going to be talking to you about how database servers make sure that your data don't get corrupted during important things such as transferring money from one bank account to another. And then I'm going to discuss about how much I hate MySQL during that because MySQL is really stupid for this. Um, it's definitely not a database I'd use for financial operations by any stretch of the imagination. But you know, it is what it is. Week 14 is the final review. Week 15, we're going to find ourselves in some other room somewhere to write a test on our computers again. So that's the plan. How, here's how the breakdown of the grades are going to be. And actually, I'm going to kill these light up front. I forgot how stupid this room was. Which one's it going to be? This one? There we go. The switches have changed since the last time I taught in this room. And it's been way more than two years since I've been in here. So, grading breakdown is as follows. Labs are half your grade. Each test is 25%. There's two tests. Originally, it was 20 and 30 because when this course was moved into the 14-week format, the reading week was actually a week earlier. So there's more content in the second half than the first half. Now that they finally sorted that out, it's a literally 50-50 split of content, first half, second half. So why make the tests be worth more than one or the other? The good news is these are progressive tests in the sense of test one covers weeks one to six, thereabouts. Test two covers week nine to the end. It doesn't come back, so there's no overarching exam. Congratulations. So theoretically, this is a three, two, four. Uh, two hours of lecture and an hour online. Realistically, the hour online is me telling you to read your stuff. Just read it. Uh, two hours of lab. At least half the labs do not take two hours. Not even close. Sometimes they do. It depends on who you are. Theoretically, four hours of study time. It just depends on who you are. That one, I, I love that number when we apply a specific number of study time to a student. And, you know, I've had students in the past that had as much database experience as me, and they're taking the course because they have to take the credit. Trust me, they didn't weren't doing four hours of studying a week. Other students who've never seen a database in their life, you know, you might need the four hours. Most of this content isn't that complicated. Okay. So as the course intro, does anybody have any questions before I start overloading your brains? Okay. Total silence. Crickets. Fantastic. At the back, how's my voice carrying? Pretty okay? Okay. Would you believe I actually have to talk about twice as loud as normal? to actually get her to the back. I'm losing like half my volume here. Uh, for projecting your voice, this isn't great. That's not awkward at all. Okay. So we're going to do a little bit of review from last term right off the bat to make sure that everybody's um, sort of up, you know, refreshed. Although I don't think we had all that long of a break between the two terms, so it shouldn't be that bad. So quick review, keys. Keys are the ability to identify each row in the table uniquely. It is like your student number at the school, your SIN number if you're a Canadian citizen, passport or visa number if you're an exchange student, oh, you know, a foreign exchange student or whatever they call them now. It's a way to uniquely identify a row. Um, each row must have its own keys. And it's a way to make sure that the entire row, there's always a unique way to find what's in it. That's what a key is. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys might have learned about primary keys last term. If not, we're going to get into a bit more detail. Um, so what happens if you don't have a unique identifier? There's a chance that data will be duplicated. 
Now, this is where I tend to pick on people that have common last names in their whatever country they come from. Right? Do you know how many Goudreaux are in Canada with my last name? There's an insane number of us. Like, I, last time I checked, there's like 100,000 of us. And technically, we're all related, which is even scarier. Um, I could reach out to the Vietnamese with the joy of uh, the wings, spelt N-G-U-Y-E-N. Because, you know, half the country has the same last name. Literally. It is, you know, it's hard to use certain things as being unique. Therefore, we need unique keys to help make sure that if we have people with the same name, they stay unique in such a way we can still find them. Um, we'd have a really hard time counting rows because if we don't have unique data, that means we're counting stuff that is potentially duplicated. So it's as if I went one, two, three, four, three, four, three, four, five, because you know I've got the same people five times in the table. Are they the same people? Are they not? I don't know because there's no way to uniquely identify them. The integrity, the quality, and the accuracy of the data would degrade again because I cannot be 100% certain that every row contains unique data. If I've got six Wangs in a class and two of them, their first name is Yun, how do I know which one's which unless I know their student number? Right? Same thing here. Like, how do I know this number is accurate unless I actually double check the student numbers? There is, you know, not having keys helps your data go south. So essentially, the main role of keys is to make sure things are unique and allows you to relate tables to each other. This is stuff more or less that might have been covered last term. I really don't know what they teach at level one, but you probably learned, learned about doing joins across keys. That's what keys are for. Uh, I can guarantee your where clauses would be nightmares if you didn't have keys. Take it as someone who has worked with databases where the designer must have been on shrooms when he made it. It was not a good time. And for those of you that don't know what shrooms are, well, you know, ask somebody who does. But dude's brain was not in the right place. So there are many kinds of keys. However, there's three that we need to know for this course. The primary key, which is a one or many columns, right? So there's either one or multiple columns that uniquely identify each row in the database, also known as you know the primary key. The foreign key, which basically is a field in one table whose value comes from the primary key of another table. Not that complicated a concept. And then a composite key, which is a primary key that's made up of multiple pieces. They used to be really popular in the 70s and 80s and early 90s. And the last 10, 15 years or so, composite keys are not quite as popular because people are realizing they're kind of stupid and it makes things more complicated than they need to be. So these terms are not exclusive. So a technically a key can be a primary key and a composite key. A theoretically, you could actually have a key that's all three. So you have a child table where the primary key is a composite key, but those two values are made, say there's two fields, they're made up from the primary keys of other tables. So basically you get to pick as many of these as you want at once. It's entirely possible to do all three. Um, as a database designer, it makes me cry when I see that, but that's because of the kind of work I do. Right, so doesn't mean it's wrong, it just hurts me a little bit on the inside. I will try to teach you guys the right way to do it, or at least the modern way that uh, basically IBM and uh, Microsoft and pretty much every framework developer for PHP and Ruby and Python have all agreed on how to do things. So I'm going to try to teach you that way, which should work. Okay, right. continuing with the primary keys. So the primary key is one or more columns, right? Also known as attributes that uniquely identify each row in a database. Okay, this I'm repeating myself now. Normally, 
in a modern database, the primary key is a sequence of numbers, right? It's an integer that auto increments, one, two, three, four, five. Once two is used, you can't go back to two because it's been used. So that's a modern one. The old ones, they used to get really fancy and use, you know, all kinds of things. Phone numbers I've seen, which was such a great idea. Um, as nowadays, you know, phone number, phone number in the 80s, you know, you got a phone number, you had that phone number for life. Nowadays, you know, oh, I don't like my phone number, go back to your cell provider, I need a new phone number. Bam, two minutes later, you got a new phone number. Woo, phone numbers don't mean anything. So sequential ind indexes are great. I mean, sequential uh, numbers for your primary key is a good thing because they don't actually have real world meaning. Um, it's possible to use other values as long as they're guaranteed to be unique. And the school here actually had a problem years and years and years ago, um, especially when we started having more international students. Because a Canadian student gets registered with their SIN number, right? So for those of you that aren't from Canada, that's our social insurance number. Basically, it's our magic number that the government uses us to, ident to identify us. They had a case where they had a few exchange students that came in with their passport numbers added it was the exact same number as somebody's SIN number in the system. Oops. So they were using, you know, a real world piece of data because they said, ah, oh, what are the odds of having duplicates? Well, when the, the international students outnumber the regular students two to one, it's bound to happen to have problems like that. Um, so you can use other values as long as they're guaranteed to be unique, guaranteed to be unique. And sometimes you don't realize how things are not unique until it blows up in your face. A primary key cannot be null, and it must be unique. Again, the word unique. And it cannot be null because the absence of value, technically, if you really want to mince words on it, the very first row could have a null because it'd be only in there once. It'd be unique. You could never have it a second time. How would you go find a record where the identifier is null? And how would you put that, make that work in a, say, an interface like a website? It wouldn't work. So a primary key cannot be null, and most database servers will set it to not null automatically. End of story. So at one point, somebody got smart enough to make sure the database server would not let you shoot yourself in the foot. It's good. Normally, we're trying to use an auto-generated ID when nothing else is suitable as a primary key, this is known as a surrogate key or synthetic key. Uh, it's personally, I, that's, I think that's the way to go. Uh, so examples of primary keys, again, the SID number, which worked for Algonquin for years until it didn't work anymore. Um, email addresses, oh, that's such a good one. If it's a website like, say, Adobe, they only want you to have your email address in there once anyways, right? So. It can work for the most part. Is it gonna change though on you? Potentially your email address may change. How many of you have had the same email address since you've been, you know, whenever you were allowed to have your first email address? Is it a Gmail address? Oh. Okay, fine. It's better than nothing. But same idea, right? So out of the whole group, I had one person raise their hand. Maybe two or three, I don't know. I saw some general gestures in that direction. but. It's, you know, email addresses are fine, but they change. So you tend to want to pick things that are immutable for your primary keys, right? Things that do not change. Auto-generated IDs, again, they have no real world business meaning. Your student numbers are basically coming out of a sequence. Starts at zero and works its way up. The ones are guaranteed to be unique in our system. Driver's license numbers, at least in Ontario, are your numbers are unique, and they're actually pretty much unique across Canada. I don't know what driver's license numbers look like in other countries, but you know, usually it's a pretty safe one. But then again, not everybody has a driver's license number. In this group, if the, my, the historical stats apply, half of you don't have a driver's license, or at least not a Canadian driver's license. So. You can't really use that. So then again, we go back to the auto-generated ID because at least we know for a fact we can get that. 
Okay, a foreign key is a primary key from another table that is used to form relationships through the key. It doesn't have to follow the rules of primary key. It doesn't need to be unique, and it can be null. Um, not sure what the heck that, there's a typo in there, but it should be, does not need to be unique, and it can be null, because sometimes you don't know the value of a foreign key. Um, a good example would be status on a shipment. Who's the carrier? When the order is placed, they don't, you don't, they don't put in the carrier on your order until it gets allocated a, a way bill. And then, you know, it's going to show up with, you know, UPS, Pure Later, Amazon, Intelcom, or good old Joey Co. who throws the package from the front curb. You know, the, for Amazon's a good example of never knowing how your package is going to get to your house. If it's going to get to your house. Um, a foreign key can become part of the primary key on the new table because it might be needed to uniquely identify the child rows. I'll be talking about what kind of relationships those are in a bit. Uh, if the foreign key becomes part of the primary key, it can no longer be null, obviously, because the primary key must have a value, it cannot be null. So if the foreign key is also part of the primary key, it can't be null. Um, and again, a foreign key can be more one or more columns from another table. And it's a way of uniquely identify the parent record, essentially. Um, a good example, again, is an order at the store. When you have an order from Amazon or from, you know, Wish or AliExpress or insert preferred store here, and you have an order, those orders are all attached to single orders. That means that, that each of those items have an order ID attached to them, which relates it to the actual order where you took your payment. Then you got the composite key. So that's a key made up of multiple columns. Um, it's entirely possible to use them. It's okay to use them as a primary key if you have no other choice. Um, theoretically, if you can use a combination of columns, it'll save some resources. But honestly, it's kind of stupid using that as an excuse. How much room on a disk does one, an integer take? So back in the day when database design was, you know, becoming more of a thing, we had computers where, you know, my friend had a one, I remember when they got their first computer at their house, he had a 22 megabyte hard drive. Yeah, you cared about that space that those integers were taking when you had 22 megabytes total for everything, including DOS and Windows. And yes, you could fit DOS and Windows on 22 megabytes back then. God, I'm old. But nowadays when, you know, my laptop's got two one terabyte drives in it. And that machine's four and a half years old. I'm guaranteeing that pretty much no machine in here has less than a 500 megabyte drive. I mean, 500 gigabyte drive, 500 megabyte, 500 gig drives. Space is not that important anymore, like it used to be. It's not a premium. It's a commodity. Especially if you're talking about moving your resources into the cloud anyways. Amazon, Azure, Rackspace, Oracle. Pity if you do that, but you know, Oracle. Disk space doesn't even exist in that world. It exists, but it doesn't really exist. It'll just keep growing until they send you nice big fat bills. So, yeah, you could theoretically reuse columns to save on resources, but realistically, no. Um, normally, you want to think about how complicated your code is going to be and make your decisions based on that. Again, thinking back to your S introductory SQL classes, if you had to do a where, and you're joining a table, and to join the table, you had to include two to three columns as part of your join clause, as opposed to saying where ID is equal to foreign ID. Or the other choice you'd have, you know, where SIN number is equal to other SIN number, and last name is equal to last name, and phone number is equal to this, because you decide those three combined were the safest bet. I guarantee 
that joining across a single column will be significantly simpler and your developers will not hate you with a burning passion. All right, so here's a composite key. So picture this one as being, there's a table of students, a table of classes, and to determine the class list, you do a foreign key of each, and that ends up being a compound primary key. This is pretty much the only place that this is acceptable. Having a compound primary key that's made up of two foreign keys is when you're bridging multiple tables. Um, at times it might even get more complicated than that, but you know, that's what it is. So this is a composite key made out of two foreign keys. And here's another one which have the customer ID in the customer and then the order has a compound key with one piece being part of the foreign key. Um, yeah, there's not much I can say to that other than, as you can see, the, the primary key is made out of two columns. One of them is the foreign key. And um, whoever made up this slide, by the way, that wasn't me. That's the dumbest example I've ever seen. I'm just gonna put it out there now. Because you know what? If your order ID is auto incrementing, who cares if the customer key is part of the primary key? Because the order ID is always gonna be unique anyways. But that shows you how it could be done if you really wanted to. And there are shops where the design philosophy is literally that, and you have to do it that way. But then every time you want to pull up an order, uniquely you have to feed it both the order ID and the customer ID every time. Which tells me that whoever designed it that way expected order IDs to get duplicated for whatever reason. Can you imagine if uh, you're working in a call center and you ask the person, hey, what's your order number so I can look you up and they give you an order number and six orders come up? All six belong to six different people. Then you have to say, well, what's your phone number so I can make sure I got the right one? Yeah, no. All right, so we're done talking about keys, finally. I think that was enough boredom for everybody. So tables are made up of some basic pieces. They have a name. They have to be identified in the system somehow. Columns are identified also by a name. So each of the attributes have column, have names. Um, rows are identified by a set of columns. In other words, a combination of every column is a row. And this is where I shudder whenever I use Excel, Excel as an example, because Excel is not a database. But when you want to picture what we're talking about, you've got your columns in Excel going across the top, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you've got the rows one, two, three, four, five going down the side. Every row has a collection of columns and that's basically a record. So picture that as the table where, you know, a single row of data is a collection of the columns. You guys have already done SQL, so you have a rough idea what I'm talking about. And every table normally has a primary key. It happens to have, you have tables that don't have primary keys. It's not a good thing. Um, now you can just remember the last 20 minutes of me ranting and you'd know what I'm talking about. Primary keys are needed. Uh, okay, so a table is the physical representation. So in the computer, the bits and the bytes on the disk inside of the database engine is a table. But before it becomes a table, it is an entity. I was just checking my time. <laughs> um, an entity. So <coughs> an entity is a thing. And it could, uh, as I love using the phrase a thing because a lot of students will look at me and go, that's got to be the vaguest description of, a, of an entity there is. That literally is what an entity is. It's a thing. And when we think about the things, it can be a person, students, or a prof, a place, this classroom, an object, you know, my laptop's an object, this table's an object, your bottles of water are objects, they're things. 
an event. You're attending a class. It's an event. Congratulations. You're attending an event today. But that's still a thing. Even a concept in your environment, which at that point, concepts get a little weird, but concepts are still a thing also. There's something. Whether the concept is, I really have a hard time coming up with an example of a concept in an environment. Um, so, for example, a concept in a user environment would be, um, anybody here work in a job where you have to punch in and punch out at a clock? A lot of people that work at like McDonald's or Walmart, you come in and you actually punch in and punch out to start your day and end your day. Tim Horn's Ikea, those places, right? The punch in and punch out times are things, but they're more of a concept, right? They're not an actual physical thing that you can represent because boop, 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 and done. It doesn't exist anymore because you finish pressing the buttons. But by the same token, it's a concept that Ikea, for example, really cares about. McDonald's may care about. So, but that's still, your time entries are a thing. It's a concept. So that's an entity. An entity type is a collection of entities that share a common property or characteristic. So an entity is each of you. Your entity type would be students. As an entity type of students, you all share certain common pieces of data a student number, a name, uh, what courses you're taking, who your profs are. Those are, that's an entity type. Actually, I just threw like three entity types at once in there. But as a student, you all have certain things you share, right? Name, student number, contact information, email address, phone number, network ID, that kind of stuff. You all have the same base set of properties that the school uses to identify you as a type of entity. I have very similar types, but I have a slightly different set of flags because I'm not a student. And then an entity instance is literally each one of you. So a, an entity and entity type can often be used interchangeably. They're pretty much the same thing, right? So we're describing a thing and a student is a thing. But if I want to talk about a specific student, then I'm talking about an entity instance, an instance of that entity. So type is student, instance is one of you, or you, or you, or you, or, or three of you. I could pick three instances out of the group, right? But they're instances. In other words, each of you is a collection of the attributes that define a student according to the school. Outside of the school, you might be a totally different kind of entity, you know? McDonald's burger flipper, Ikea, what the hell do they call them? Coworkers, corporate slave, insert your pick here of what you want to be. But when we talk about entities, types, and instances, that's literally it. Students are an entity slash type and each of your individual instances. And I'm going to skip this because I just finished giving examples. <laughs> um, attributes. Okay. So if an entity slash entity type describes a concept such as a thing or a student or whatever, right? There's certain attributes that are used for each one of those instances to describe them. So an entity will have attributes. If an entity becomes a table in a database, the attributes become the fields or columns. Attributes. Let's go with easy ones, student number, first name, last name, right? But that one gets a little weird with some uh, international students because in some countries people don't have one of the two for cultural reasons. I'm looking at you, India. They've got a lot of people there where they come here, they just give themselves a second line. They give their first name as their last name because they don't actually have a last name. I have no idea how that works, but anyways, that's how it is, depending where you come from. Uh, another one would be a date of birth, right? How old is the person? Um, address, phone numbers, 
Maybe if you're an exchange student, you might be looking at a, uh, a passport number, a visa number, SIN numbers. These are all attributes that define a student. Later on, the relationships will define what classes you're in, but to define a single student, those are the basic attributes. You probably all remember filling out those nice big forms, eh? Well, actually, it's all online now. I remember when I went through, I had to apply for college, it was like pages and pages of paperwork. And then the end, it's like, I want to go to Canada and take this course. I want to go to Sheridan and take this course. But there was like three pages of crap before I could fill in like five lines for like 150 bucks. Uh, you know, $30 a line. It was kind of scary in the 90s. Um, often attributes can be defined using nouns. Right? Or a combination nouns. Date of birth. It's not a noun, but it's, it's a phrase that basically means one thing. Uh, given name, you know, family name, address, telephone number. They're not verbs. Those are basically nouns or phrases that can be used as nouns. And all attributes, you normally have values. There might be optional values, like, say, phone number two, alternative email address. There could be alternative attributes that aren't required but are still a part of the thing, let's say. Um, so those are the attributes. So basically, it's what you use to describe the entities. And I'm going to skip the examples because I just finished giving examples. Can you tell I've been teaching this for a while? Before? I, I don't even need to look at the slides to know what I'm supposed to teach next. Um, so relationships. This is where get things get complicated. A relationship describes how one entity may associate with another entity or entities. And often these are verbs. So when you're initially doing the description of it on paper, right, you're going to write out the relationships between things. This is usually the verbs, right? A professor teaches the students. That's the relationship here. A student is tortured by the professor. Sorry, is taught by the professor. T wrong T word. But, you know, there's verbs. Um, a student attends a class. A student has been assigned a class. The relationships can be described using verbs. These will turn into actual relationships in the database later. But when you are doing the initial description, you tend to use verbs. And there's three types of relationships. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to go through them in detail. There's one-to-one, -one, one to many, and many to many. And I'm going to go through a few examples in a minute. But essentially, the relationship has a notation. Now, the one we're going to use in this class is called crow's foot. It's been around forever. There are other notations for database. Um, there's at least six others. And once in a while, somebody comes up with a new one, thinking they're smarter than everybody else. And it just ends up looking like one of the others already because there's only so many ways you can describe this on paper. Um, so in this class, you know, they got a professor going to the office. So now I'm going to go back to talk about the relationships because I'm pretty sure I got slides later for this, but in case I don't, I want to uh, make sure I don't forget it. Okay, so a one-to-one -one relationship is a relationship where one entity is related to an entity, other entity once. And people sometimes get confused between the one-to-many and the one-to-one. -one. Let's just say one-to-one -one is very uncommon. It's not something you see on the regular. Often it's used when you either A, run out of room in a table structure, which in modern, data, modern database engines is almost impossible, or you need to separate the data so that part of it is secured or encrypted. So a one record matches another record once and only once. Um, one to many, that's the one that most people understand fairly easily. For CSD 8215, I have many students. You guys have one professor. One to many. Same thing with doing a grocery list. You do a, you go to the store, you put many things in your shopping cart, and when you check out, you get one receipt, right, with everything you bought on it. So your purchase 
is a one-to-many relationship. You bought, with that one single purchase, you bought many items, but each of those items that it's now in your bag only belongs to one purchase because you paid for it, so it's yours. And then you've got many-to-many. So many to many is something that's done on the concept level. Once you get to the physical level, there's no such thing as many to many. Um, in other words, I teach many classes and thus I have many students and you guys have many courses, right? With many profs. So basically your relationship between students and profs in this course is a many to many relationship because each prof or this program, I should say. Each prof has many students, and each student has many profs. And how is it linked? Across the, the class section, right? But when we're designing at the concept level, it's literally student, prof, many to many. It, most database servers will not allow you to create a many to many relationship anymore. It used to be possible. And uh, years ago, I inherited one where the designer somehow managed to make it many to many. And I started cleaning up the database and I deleted one row and after it was done 20 minutes later, two thirds of the table was gone because the record was like a relationship in Kentucky. Every other row, every row was related to every other row. It was pretty gross, um, which explained why uh, deleting a single row took 20 minutes. For those of you that have done a bit of SQL, you know by now a delete does not take 20 minutes in a computer. Even back in the early 90s, it didn't take 20 minutes. Might have taken, you know, a quarter of a second. Uh. Okay. So as a quick overview of what I just finished talking about, um, entities, there's instances and types. So this is the point form of my last 15 minutes worth of talking. I'm not going to go through that slide too much. You all have access to these slides. So, but essentially an instance is a thing. A type is a collection of things. That's a pretty straightforward concept. Attributes describe a thing. And the relationships determine how one thing is connected to another thing. I've got people I don't like the fact that I use the word thing a lot, but literally that's what it is. It's a thing, right? Students are things, profs are things, classrooms are things, courses are things, and how are they connected? By relationships. And they're described using attributes, but they're all things. Okay, so. An entity should be an object that has many instances in the database. You do not design an entity for one thing and only one thing. What's the point of storing the description of a single thing in the database? Why go to all that work for something that will never, that, you'll, that will only exist uniquely once, right? Imagine if we, in the database system, instead of creating a table for students, we literally created a, student, a table for every student. So we'd have like table A1, table A2, table A3, and each of those is a different person. That is like the epitome of foolishness. So in other words, you want to design an entity that represents more than one thing. More sorry, it represents more of than one of the same thing. There we go, that's a better phrase. It should be made up of multiple attributes. Again, why would you create a table where there's only ever one attribute? Create table, ID, INT, auto increment, done, that's it. Table only has IDs in it, totally useless. And it should be something we're trying to model. So a thing, an object, a concept. What it should not be is a user of the database system. And this one sounds kind of weird when I say that, right? Because most database systems 
have users in it, right? I mean, you guys log into Brightspace with a username and a password. You log into e to Office or Outlook or whatever, username and password. Log into Hotmail, username and password. You became a victim. Um, but what you shouldn't be modeling is a specific user of the system. So when we model the data, we're not going to create a Dan model. We'll create a professor model. It, because we're not going to specifically model one person. We're going to model a generic concept of a user instead. And it should not be the output of the database system. For example, a report. You're not going to store the report as an entity. You might store the definition of the report as, a, as an entity. As in other words, you have a table with a bunch of different reports defined in it. But you're not going to actually def design just that one report as an entity in the system. That's dumb. Because it's pointless design. So there are two kinds of entities when you talk about databases. They're strong and weak entities. A strong entity has a primary key and is able to live independently of others, theoretically. Um, a student is actually a pretty strong entity in our in Algonquin system because you put a, a student in the system, their record can exist without depending on anything else, right? A weak entity is like that person who is totally undefined without a significant other. We've all had friends like that, where they cannot, their whole self is defined by the person they're attached to. A weak entity in the database is very similar to that. In other words, it does not have a primary key of its own. It may have a primary key, but it's made up of information coming from other tables. So it doesn't have a unique identifier of its own that it can call its own. That means it's always dependent on another entity to exist. Um, for example, an order line can be considered a weak entity. Why? If it does not have an order, the order line cannot exist. So for example, we'll go back to shopping on Amazon. You add stuff to your shopping cart. <coughs> Fantastic. You check out. Once you've checked out, Amazon creates an order and attaches each of the things in your shopping cart to that order, right? So it basically creates an, an order line. But those order lines cannot exist unless there's an order in there first to attach to. Same deal with going to the grocery store. You go to the grocery store, you buy some bananas, you pay for the bananas, you get a receipt. The receipt identifies the fact that you bought those bananas. So at that point, those bananas actually belong to that receipt. The, belo the receipt belongs to you, which means the belo bananas don't belong to you. But until the moment where the bananas were actually attached to a receipt, they don't belong to you, right? It's just a concept floating out there until you pay for it. But those bananas, in, at Loblaws are a weak entity because unless you've paid for them and you have proof with a receipt, technically, they don't exist. Same idea. Um, so a weak entity requires something else to define it. A strong entity can stand on its own. It's a pretty straightforward concept. Um, does anybody have a question about this before I move on? Because usually I get at least one or two blank stares at this stage. Um, but if I did a pretty good job explaining it, we'll move on. You know, feel free to interrupt or put up your hand or whatever. All right. Yeah. Previous slide. An output is a report. An invoice. So for example, you bought something on Amazon. You get an email saying, hey, you bought this for this much amount of money. 
That is an output. You don't store that email in the database. Well, Amazon might, but you know, you usually don't store the email itself in the database. You have all the data you need to craft that email. You store, so, so you don't store the, the big, the whole Amazon, thanks for buying this message, right? If I were to pull up an email, for example, Intelcom's about to deliver something to my house, and it's probably gonna melt on my front step. <laughs> the email that Intelcom sends you, they don't store that email in the database. What they have in there is the address, the parcel number, and your email address. That's the three pieces they need to craft the email. The email is an output. The output is generated based on the data in the database, but you don't actually store the actual email in the database. Does that make a bit more sense? Okay, good. Yes, if you don't un understand anything, feel free to interrupt me. Okay. So, back to the strong and the weak entities. A loan is a strong entity. You borrowed money from someone, hopefully from a legitimate place. Legitimate places don't tend to break your knees. A loan is a strong entity. It can exist on its own. It's in the system, the loan is attached to you, yes, but it's able to exist by itself. A payment on the other hand is a weak entity because imagine you walked into a bank and you say, I wanna make a payment. They go, what's your loan? They go, I don't care, just take my money. The bank, the teller's gonna look at you like, what the hell is wrong with you, right? A payment is a weak entity. The payment has to be attached to something. Even when you pay a bill, right? You open up your bank account and then you cry about how little money you got left for beer this month because you gotta pay your cell phone bill and you went over your data plan like three times over. Although now we're kind of protected from that, but I remember days when you get a bill for a thousand bucks in the mail. And you sit there and pay a bill. When you make that payment, it's being attached to your, your cell phone bill. You cannot make a payment at the bank unless you're making a payment against something. In this case, a loan. So a loan is a strong entity because it can exist without anything else. The payment is a weak entity because it cannot exist unless it's being attached to something else. Pretty, pretty clear? Kind of? Okay. Now we're gonna talk about some attributes. I think we're two thirds of the way through this, so we're getting there. Attributes. So they are the properties or characteristics of an entity. In other words, how do we describe an entity? And there's different classifications. There's required versus optional. Simple versus composite, single valued versus multi-valued, stored versus derived, and I'm actually gonna cover those in a few moments. And then identifiers. Identifiers are keys, okay? Okay, so, required versus optional attributes. A required field uh, has to have a value for every instance in the database. So every row of data in the database must have a value in a required attribute. And if we look at our happy little chart here, um, you'll see that the first, well, all the fields except the major are required. For example, when you first register with the school, depending on how you registered, okay, let's be clear here, in case you didn't go through Ontario colleges or whatever, they will ask you certain pieces of information, but until you're done the registration process, you exist in the system as a student without being assigned to a program. So in this case, they're saying the person's major is optional because a person can be in the system and not tied to a major, or in this case, a program. Same idea applies to you finished your program, you graduated, you're still in the system, but you're not part of that program anymore, but you're still in the system. So, an optional is something that you know might not be populated. How many of you have more than one phone number? Okay, finally, first that. How many of you have more than one Canadian phone number? Okay, a few, right? You have a home phone number, you have a cell phone number. 
Some of you only have a cell phone because most people are now going on to, I only got a cell phone, right? So maybe a second phone number field would be an optional field because not everybody's gonna have two numbers. But the first phone number field's probably pretty required because how the heck are we gonna get a hold of you? All right, simple versus composite. Simple attributes are easy to understand. Given name, family name, date of birth, city, right? That field contains one thing. And actually it's kind of stupid because I, I used up uh, some of the examples that are part of the composite. When you're doing the initial design process, you can actually have composite attributes. And a composite attribute is an attribute made up of multiple pieces. In this case, we are using an address as a composite attribute. So at first when you're starting doing the initial design, you're not gonna get into the nitty gritty of all the details yet because you're just designing the concepts, right? So you're gonna say, an employee has an address. Bang, good enough. But address is actually a composite attribute. Because you got like street address one, possibly street address two, city, uh, political division, I like using that phrase, instead of state, province, county, ward, you know, depending what part of the world you come in, that last one has a different name. Uh, postal code, country, those are all attributes that make up an address. But at the initial design phase, you might just put down the word address because we know it's a composite attribute. It's made up of more than one thing. When you get to the point where you're doing the physical design at the end, as in creating the actual tables in the database, there's no such thing as a composite. You're gonna break those down into its individual pieces. So that everything becomes simple attributes. Okay, so just a little bit more on this. A course is pretty simple. It has a code and a title. A name, again, at first we might say it's a student's name, but a student's name might be made up of first name, middle name, last name. And depending where they come from in the world, they might have, you know, one, two, three, or more, right? I don't know if I have any Hispanic students in here, but you know, you know what I'm gonna talk about when I talk about having so many names. I had a student from Puerto Rico years ago. He had four first names and three middle names. And he actually responded to any of them. It was kind of amazing. It became a game in class when I'd call him out in class. And I'd just use one of his many names and he'd answer every single time. And I said, how you got so good? He goes, my mother has sandals. Like, what does that mean? He goes, chocolate, that's all you need to know. So I don't know what that actually meant, but I got a pretty good idea what that meant. Um, so you got multi-valued and derived attributes. So a multi-valued attribute is an attribute that may have one or more values in it. Now, as opposed to a composite attribute, which is made up of a, it's an attribute made up of multiple simple attributes. A multi-valued one is an attribute that has multiple values in it for the same thing. One of the best example is in this slide has skills. That's a multi-valued attribute. When you're defining an employee record, and some companies actually can't like to keep track of what your skill set is, when they're doing the initial design, <coughs> the skill um, will be just listed as a skill, but really a skill is a multiple list, right? If we start listing off each of you, we're to list off your skills. You're gonna have multiple. At the initial design phase, skills, is it okay to be put in as an attribute as long as you actually identify it as a multi-valued? Later on, anything that's multi-valued will become a child table. You'll create, break it out into another table, have a foreign key, one to many. Most people have more than one skill. I hope most of us have more than one skill. It's nice to be a one-trick pony, but you know, if you're planning to be a web developer, you have to have more than one skill. And in the, as things go on in the modern age and the web development, we have lots and lots of skills, right? The number of uh, random alphabet soup we can tie to our skill set gets pretty crazy. You know, you got SQL, HTML, ECMAScript, 
PHP, Python, you know, a bunch of alphabet soup. These are all skills we're supposed to develop as developers. So that's a list. Later on, when it gets put into the actual physical database, that list is actually broken down to its own entity. A derived attribute is another thing where we can store at the design phase, but at the physical phase, we do not include it unless it's for performance reasons. A derived attribute, the best example I have that everybody understands is age. How old are you? Often when you're doing the initial design, you'll put down an attribute of age. It's derived because realistically, you're gonna put in the person's date of birth. Can you imagine if you had to go and update the database records every day for every time a single person aged one year? You know, it's my birthday today. Somebody's gotta go into the database and change your age. No, you store the date of birth because you can calculate the person's age based on their date of birth. Regardless of how gross date math is, you can still calculate a person's age based on their date of birth. That is a derived attribute. Another derived attribute that you guys probably experience on a regular basis is a line total. Again, let's go back to Loblaws. We're gonna go buy some more bananas. Bananas are sitting at, uh, what is it? Uh, 79 cents a pound right now. I don't know what it is in kilos. I was raised with pounds, so I was thinking things in pounds. X minus pennies per weight unit. Put the bananas on the scale. Type in 04, no, 4011. Bam, it tells you you're gonna pay this much for your bananas. That number is weight times um, cost is your derived attribute. Now systems like Loblaws will actually store those derived values for performance reasons. At the end of the day, when they're running the end of day books, they do not want to have to recalculate every single receipt that went through the store. If you are running a smaller business where you're not dealing with a million dollars worth of transactions a day, often you're not going to store the line totals. Why? Because price times quantity minus discount times taxes is your total. You can calculate it. So any number that you can calculate, you don't store. You store the pieces to let you calculate it, but you don't store the actual end result, unless of course, like I said before, you're gonna do it for performance reasons. And usually that happens in a data warehouse at the end of the day. So at night, they're gonna run the daily reports, they're gonna do the math all over again, shove that into a data warehouse so it never needs to be calculated again. But on a day-to-day -day transaction basis, they're not gonna store the line total. No more than they're gonna store the order total. Why? What's an order total? They call the line totals, add them up, bang. Right, you go, select some of the order lines from, you know, order lines where order is equal to one. I'm super simplifying that, but you know, that's basically what it's doing. That is a derived attribute. We do not store derived attributes, but we can put them on paper while we're designing. Later on, we figure out how to not store the derived attributes because if you're actually storing the derived attribute, that means somebody manually or somebody had to write a script to fix it or somebody has to go and manually, you know, touch them up every day. And let me tell you, that is a terrible use of manpower. Time is money. If you're paying someone to do such a stupid job, they're wasting money. Automate the thing instead. Make them do something more productive. So when you're defining attributes, you have to do the following things. State what the attribute is and why it's important. So this is the documentation phase when you're doing the initial discovery. You have to say, okay, date of birth is an attribute. Why is it important? Well, because we need to know when the person was born, if they're old enough to be in the school or not, right? College doesn't really have a minimum age, but grade schools do, right? So you're technically not allowed to enroll for junior kindergarten until you're four years old. How do they decide that? You gotta be born before September 1st of whatever year. At least that's how they do it in the OCDSB. 
So you have to tell what the attribute is and why it's important. You should define what is and is not included in the attributes value. In other words, if you're saying that this is a person's given name, you say this will include people's given names. It's not going to include their last name. It's not going to include their dog's name. It's not going to include their cat's name. It includes their given name and only that. Um, if it has alternative names out in the wild, you should document what those things might be called. Right? Some people will call it a family name. Some people will call it a surname. Some people will say a last name. Depending on which flavor of English you speak, you may end up using a different word that means the exact same thing. These are aliases of an attribute. It should be documented. Why? Because you'll hand off the project to someone that comes from the UK, they're going to read and go, what the hell is this? Why? Because they don't use the same phrase in the UK as we use here. It's important to document stuff like this so that there's no confusion. You should state the sources of the values, as in where do the values come from? Date of birth. Well, that's on a person's birth certificate. That's not that complicated. They told me what it is. Great. Uh, sometimes when a source of value might be something else, as in it came in from a student registration, it came from, insert other reason here, right? Uh, for example, bananas 4011 is an industry standard code for bananas. It will work at every cash register that sells bananas. Why? Because someone decided 4011 was equal to bananas. That is the source of the value that, I don't remember, there's actually a name for that group that decided that's what the code for bananas was. I don't remember what they're called, but that would be the source. Um, you should state whether or not the attribute is, is um, volatile. In other words, after it's been set, can it change? The answer is yes. By the way, realistically, there is almost no attribute anymore that does not change. People change their names. People change their genders. People change their email address. I've noticed that one of my cousins had to change their SIN number. Why? Because they got, their SIN number got compromised. So they had to get a different SIN number. So everywhere where they used the SIN number to identify them, they had to go back and change their SIN number everywhere. It was really bad. The answer is yes, attributes can change. It's not in whether or not it can change. Yes, it can change. But you should say that this is uncommon. Like a SIN number shouldn't change on the weekly. Uh, you should specify whether it's required or optional. That's pretty straightforward, you know. A person's first name is required. Phone number two is optional. You should state the min and the max number of occurrences allowed. When we talk about min and max, it's more like, is it required? Is there one? Is there more than one? Second, you go to more than one. It could be two, could be 5,000. That doesn't make a difference. It's basically zero, one, or more. And you should state how it interacts with other, other attributes. Uh, excuse me. As in, you can't have a phone number without somebody's name. Can you imagine if I had a student record and all I had down there was a phone number? I don't even know who they are. But I just have a phone number. Uh, 5204, are you in the room today? 5204? No. Right? So you can't have a phone number without a person's name. That's just common sense, but you'd think... It would be common sense, but it's not necessarily common sense. Uh, then we start identifying keys. Um, again, when you're doing the initial design, you're going to have candidate identifiers. As in, you're going to look at the data that you have. You go, these two columns might work. These two attributes might work as an identifier. Uh, in the end, the answer is, who cares? You're going to use a, you're going to use a synthetic key anyways, but. In the beginning, you're going to try to identify candidate identifiers so that you have a way to at least try to uniquely identify stuff at the beginning. And we've done the, the keys already, so I'm going to skip the stuff on keys. So, however, when we're talking about identifiers, you want to change, if you're going to insist on using real world data, you want to pick stuff that will not change in value and that will not be null. Again, it used to be SIN numbers were a safe bet in Canada up till eh, about 15 years ago. And then, you know, identity theft just took off like a rocket to the moon. And 
but usually you try to choose identifiers that won't change in value. So when you're doing the initial design, it's okay to use something like a SIN number because it's pretty safe. Later on, you're probably going to drop it, but at the beginning, you're probably going to use it. You want it to be something that's not going to be null. For example, um, if you had a field that's for Canadian phone number and somebody just moved to Canada and they don't have a cell phone number yet or a landline, they don't have a phone number. What are they going to put in there? So you can't really use a phone number as an identifier because it's not always 100% guaranteed the person's going to have a phone number. Um, yes, I guess you could put your international phone number. Right, so put in your nice long number with the you know three-digit country code in the front and stuff like that, and I guarantee that probably 30% of databases written in Canada will blow up the second you try to put that kind of phone number in it. Why? It's going to be too long. Phone numbers in Canada have 10 digits. 11 if they insist on including the one. Avoid intelligent identifiers. I intelligent identifiers are. It's kind of a funny phrase because they're actually really stupid identifiers. But it's basically, basically the phrase came because somebody along once, once upon a time said, I'm so smart. I'm going to use my super intelligence and I'm going to use these attributes to identify things. To promptly have it blow up in their face. So don't use an address as an identifier. Why? How many of you have had the exact same address your entire life? from the day you were born. So you're still living at home with your parents and you were born here in Ottawa? Okay, there, see? You have more than one address. Actually, that's funny when I say that because my daughter is an example of one that's had the same address her entire life. 22 years, any day now. 22 years, right? She lives in my basement. She still has one address because we live like a 20 minute walk that way. So she's been, she never had to move. So avoid locations, avoid people's names because people's names change. Most, a lot of countries when, when a woman gets married, they take their partner's last name. Or a man gets married to another guy, they'll take one of the two names, it happens. In Japan, last name depends on whose family you decide to marry into. It's kind of cool. Take the wife's name, take the husband's name, whatever works, whatever's happy, it's a piece of paper and a stamp. In so avoid names because names change. And if you've got really long, complicated keys, substitute it for a nice short surrogate key. Why? Because it's simple. All right, now to talk about relationships. We're almost done. I swear, and we're almost done time-wise too. Okay, um, I already talked about what the different types are, but I'm just gonna go into a bit more detail. Um, Actually, I'm not going to go into more detail. One to one, you know what they are. One to many, I described. Many to many, I did already. Um, but there's something called degrees of relationships. And it's the number of relationships an entity participates in. So a unary relationship is a one to one relationship, right? It's basically only connected to one thing. A binary relationship means it's connected to, it's two tables connected. So unary is connected to itself. Binary means connected to two. Ternary means connected to three. And somebody actually at one point actually had like the six other ways of saying the next set of numbers. But basically you have unary, binary, and all the others. A binary relationship is pretty straightforward, one to many. So you have two entities that are related, it's usually one to many, that's a binary relationship. If you have an entity that's related to multiple other things, for example, an order line is a perfect example. It belongs to an order, it belongs to a product, it might belong to a shipping, it might belong to a status, it might belong to a sales rep. Right, think of all the things that can identify an order or an order line depending on where you go shopping. Um, most of you probably don't remember Future Shop. but you probably all know about Best Buy. Well, for a long time, Best Buy and Future Shop were owned by the same company. The thing was is that Future Shop, people got a commission for their sales. Best Buy, people don't get commissions for their sales, so 
there was always this weird relationship when you bought something, the guy would walk it up to the front desk to get credit for the sale. That they actually had a relationship between sales rep and order line. None of that at Best Buy. So that's a, you know, more than a ternary relationship because you got an order, you got a sales rep, you've got the product, you've got, uh, you know, what's, is it sold? Has it been shipped? That kind of stuff. And there's, there's an, a picture format of the binary to the ternary. A ternary usually ends up being like the end all be all table where everything else is interconnected. Again, order lines is the best example of a, ter of a ternary or more because it has multiple things that go into it. A person and a country list would be a, one, a, a binary, right? One person, one country. Now, a unary relationship is a table that is related to itself. Um, basically, you know when you, oh man, I'm going to age myself. How many of you remember Yahoo? Okay, one. Well, I had a hand go, eh. I had another hand going, eh. Okay, way back in the day when Yahoo was the best thing on earth, because there was no good search engines, they had the directory. And you'd go, you click on a category, then you go into, an, then it would bring you another page with another bunch of categories, and you click on that, give you another bunch of categories, you click on that. Eventually, you actually had a set of links, but you could search through it like an index. And that list of categories was a unary relationship. In other words, it would be, the categories would reference themselves, as in, this is my parent, this is my parent, this is my parent. It's a bit like how at a company, you have an HR table, we have all the employees, but some of the employees are managers. So the empo one employee reports to a manager, the manager reports to a partner, the partner reports to the board of directors. They could all be stored in the same table, but there's like a self-referencing thing. That's a unary relationship. A binary relationship is when two things are interconnected. An employee works in a department. In this case, we're doing, you know, this diagram's kind of stupid because it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, but theoretically, an employee could belong to more than one department, and an employee usually has more, a department has more than one employee. And a ternary relationship, a profit student, of course, all meet up in the middle. That teach in the middle is also known as a section. So this is section 310, I think, if I remember right, maybe. I don't remember, uh, maybe 300. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, there's only one section of this running this term, so, you know, it's not that important that I remember the course section. Um, but that's a ternary relationship where, you know, you have a relationship that is that goes to multiple objects at once with at least three. There could be more. Then you have cardinality constraints. Um, so cardinality constraints is the Number of instances that one entity can be associated with another. So, remember earlier when I was talking about uh, the minimum, maximum? This is the cardinality. In other words, if a relationship is optional, then the cardinality is zero. Then if, but if it must have an entry, then it's mandatory. So that's the minimum. Cardinality, so it's zero or one. The maximum is one or more. So you have relationships that are uh, zero, one or more. You have other ones that are one or more. And others that are completely optional in both directions, then it's zero, zero in both directions. The most common, honestly, will be uh, zero or more. When we get to the diagramming side, you'll actually see the notation for this for this stuff. Um, but yeah, cardinality just basically determines how many instances interact in that relationship. In other words, in theory, I could be I could have zero, one or more students, right? In we're in May, mid-April, I didn't even know how many students I was going to have this term. Why? Because I was still teaching CST at E215. <laughs> teaching a different course. Um, and I was teaching at E250 also. But 
you know, just saying. Um, but I didn't know what the relationship to me at that point was because I was done teaching one group of students and I didn't have any more classes, but my other set of classes wasn't quite set yet. Therefore, I had zero, one or more students because at that point I had no students. And now I have, you know, or more. For you guys, you have to have a prof for a class, right? So in this case, it's a one and only one prof for this course. So the maximum cardinality is one, minimum cardinality is one. A prof is required. Imagine if there was two of us up here talking at the same time, trying to teach you at the same time, that'd be the more, right? So, it, so that's how it flips around, right? So you guess a one and only one, but I have zero, one or more students. So that's the cardinality constraints. And this is the notation, an actual fact, I'm probably gonna be calling it very shortly because there's information overload. Um, is this a good place to stop? How many do I have left? Oh, wow, still lots. Okay, this is actually a good place to stop. So I'm gonna stop at slide 44. What are you guys doing next after this? So I'm going to pick this up next week. So you don't need this for next for next for this lab this week. So, you know, it'll just feed into next week's lecture just fine. And I won't be wasting the first 20 minutes talking about myself. So, it'll fit in pretty good. So, what do you guys have to accomplish this week? Getting MySQL installed on your laptops. Now, if you have MariaDB, take that shit off first. You will not need it for this term. I'm telling you now, please, for the love that all that is holy, get rid of MariaDB before you try to put it on MySQL. My experience last term, I had a bunch of them say, yeah, I got MariaDB, I can do this course, that. Sure, go ahead and try. Then they get to the halfway mark where they can't do some of the work because it actually expects MySQL to be there. And MySQL Workbench does not work with MariaDB very well. I wonder why. Even though they're sort of compatible, they're not compatible. Um, so get MySQL installed. You don't even need to show it to me. Upload a screenshot to Brightspace. Mac users, I feel bad for you because I can't help you. Why? I've never used a Mac in my life. Um, if you have problems with your Mac, I do have a student I can reach out to that took this course last term that was an absolute wizard and he found ways around most of the problems. Alternatively, Parallels is your friend. I'm sure you're gonna hear that phrase. If any of you are neckbeards running Linux, hot damn can I ever help you? Just saying, no problems on Linux. I can help you till the cows come. I work on Linux like most of my day. I, work, I run Windows as my main development environment, but 90% of the work I do is sitting on a Linux server. It's just Windows is convenient for some things because the UI doesn't change every three weeks because it feels like changing. So if you, anybody here running the M1 Max, the brand new Max that just came out in like the last year. So there's two kinds of Macs, right? You know that? You got the Intels and the M1s. The ones that got the slightly bigger, rounder edged Macs, those are probably Intel Macs. You probably won't have a lot of problems. M1. You can actually install MySQL, MySQL Workbench on M1, no problem. You gotta go grab like a version, like three versions older. The latest version doesn't work, but three versions older seems to work just fine. So whatever they're doing as the binary translation for Intel Mac to M1 Mac, the latest build from Oracle does not work, but hey, the older one works. So go figure that one out. I have no idea. But the instructions are all set up for Windows because you know, technically, that's what it is. Um, but you know, last term I had uh, half a dozen students running Max and they didn't really have any problems, so you should be fine. You probably know how to run parallels. <laughs> you almost have to in this world uh, if you're a Mac user. Um, but yeah, get MySQL installed, upload screenshots. If you're having problems, come to lab. If you're cool, you don't need to come to lab. 
you've got uh, a week. You got until next Friday to get it installed. So literally this week and next week. Because I also know at the start of the term that there's always somebody with at least, you know, at least one person in the class with laptop problems. Uh, I've heard everything from, I just moved to Canada and my laptop has not arrived. To my laptop was confiscated at customs. But they didn't arrest me and I don't know why they took my laptop. To, um, I moved in and my roommate spilt his beer on my laptop. I've heard them all. So I know the first week's an absolute disaster for almost everybody. So I don't expect you to have it installed at the end of the lab. It'll be next Friday. I'm not sure if I went through and finally fixed all the due dates in Brightspace. Let me check really quick. Come on. Ah, oh, please. There we go. Yes, the due dates are all correct. As you can see, we are on the 11th today. The lab is due on the, I can't even read the screen, 20th. All your labs are due like the following week. Cause you know what? I've had cases where I get students say, well, the other group had two extra days. So, you know, I don't feel like it was fair. So I just give everybody like till the end of the next week. That way there's no whining about how not having had enough time to do the work. I will be in lab and the rule is I come into the lab. If I'm sitting there by myself for half an hour, I leave. I'm not going to sit at the school by myself for two hours if I don't need to be here, right? I got better things to do like going home and playing video games or, you know, sleep. There's other things we could all be doing. So if you're going to come to lab, great. Please come to the start of the lab period. That way, you know you're going to get me. I'm, I think I'm fair. That's fair. Because um, you're scheduled to be in my class at that time anyway, so therefore, you know, I don't know why you're showing up an hour late. It happens. Okay, so uh, that's it, guys. I will let you guys all run. And I will see you in lab or not see you in lab. I will try to have this video uploaded by tonight. Normally I can get it rendered and uploaded by the, by the end of the day.